Father, oh Lord, we do ask that you move upon us today. Thank you that you are here. You promised to be here. Thank you that you are at your work. And I pray, Lord, this morning that you would work in us that which is pleasing to you. May you work in us a living faith. Help me today, Lord, as I share your word. I can do nothing without you, Lord. You alone deserve all glory and honor and praise. You alone are worthy. Use your word, Lord, today to shape us, to mold us, to conform us into your likeness in an ever-increasing way. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. James is the place. If you have your New Testament, I spoke from James chapter 1 last week. I'm going to speak from James 2 didn't really plan that. It just kind of worked that way with what the Lord was uh, shaping uh, in my life. And I'm going to just say, I'm, I'm going to share something with you that I just don't quite have a handle on it myself. Is that okay? I just want to share a, a little bit of uh, what the Lord is trying to work out in me. And I, I'm a little slow, uh, but he's, he's uh, making some progress. <laughs> Thanks be to God. My wife says amen to that. But I want to speak to you about walking by a living faith. Walking by a living faith. I'm going to read from James chapter 2, starting at verse 14. I'm going to jump a, a little bit, but I'll direct you as we read together. James chapter 2, verse 14 My Bible, uh, yes, stand for the reading of God's Word. My Bible, and perhaps yours does as well, has at the beginning of verse 14 uh, a paragraph phrase. Mine says, uh, faith without works is dead. And So today we're talking about walking by or in a living faith. The Word of the Lord. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now jump with me to verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Verse 25. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Matthew Henry said this, the most plausible profession of faith without works is dead. As the root is dead when it produces nothing green, nothing of fruit. Faith is the root. Good works are the fruits. And we must see to it that we have both. That's good. And so, if you look at a tree that has fruit on it, down deep under that tree, the root of that tree represents faith. And when we are walking in a living faith, our life transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ, there ought to be in our life something that bears fruit. The life of Christ in us ought to bear the fruit that is pleasing and honoring to Christ. And here I believe James is saying that that fruit, 
the fruit that we bear our works. So, question. If the works I do bear witness to a living faith, then what kind of works should I be doing? I think that's a valid question for every believer. What kind of works should I be doing? There are certain types of works that we think about in the church. Um, One work might be playing on the worship team as a volunteer, or running the sound, or greeting at the door, or taking the offering. You know, it might be visiting someone in the hospital, visiting the sick. Perhaps it's just writing a note, a simple note that you're praying for someone, or, or making a phone call. It might be delivering a meal. Might be inviting someone out for dinner. Could be any of those things and a number, a multitude of other things that, that we often think of as works. But you know, as I read James here in James chapter 2, and I, as I particularly look at the lives, the two examples of living faith that he gave us. One was really the father of faith. The other was a whore. Is it okay for me to use that word in church? She was a harlot, a woman of the street. She was a prostitute. No matter what version you may use, uh, probably all those words are used at various translations. And yet they were both justified by their works, by faith and works. And I think the key thought that I want to convey this morning, it is not so much the actual act that we do as much as it is walking in obedience to what God has said. And as we look at these two examples of living faith, as we look at Abraham and as we look at Rahab, I believe the key that James is emphasizing and also the writer of Hebrews emphasizes their obedience. So let's look at it. I'm going to look at these two examples that James gives us from Hebrews, okay? So I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 11. That's the, the, the faith chapter. Um, and I'm going to read verse 18 and verse 17. This is about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. I've got that word bolded in my notes. He obeyed. That's the thing I want us to to look at. He obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now, we can't deny that that's faith, isn't it? To go somewhere where God commands you to go, and you don't even know where you're going. It's like, okay, Abe, just start walking south, bud, okay? Okay. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to lead you all the way. I just want you to start going. Okay. Packs up his family, packs up all his earthly possessions, and starts out. Simply obeying the word of the Lord. In the other example, in verse 17, it says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. What is interesting, when you go back to Genesis chapter 22 and you see that account, God tells Abraham to go offer his son Isaac. Now, we don't know exactly what time of the day that that was. Probably it was late afternoon or perhaps early in the evening. I don't know. There's no really no way of, of saying, knowing that in Scripture. But what's interesting to me is that the Scripture says very early the next morning. He did not dilly-dally around, as they say. He didn't waste any time. Early the next morning. Loaded up his donkey, took two servants, took Isaac. And he went, obeying the word of the Lord. Obedience. Obedience. Rahab. By faith, this is verse 31 of Hebrews 11. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, 
was not killed with those who were disobedient. You see the distinction that the Hebrew writer is making between Rahab and the rest of her people? She obeyed. There was a sense in which God Almighty was revealing to this prostitute that I, Almighty, sovereign God, I have a plan for my people. And think of this. In her heart, Rahab understood that this was the Almighty God, that the God of Israel was a lot bigger than any gods her people may have served. And and in spite of the fact that it would literally cost her country, she obeyed for the good of Almighty God, His purposes, and His plan for His people Israel. At even the risk of her own life, she obeyed. That word is the word apatheo. I think we probably get the English word apathy from that. You know, and sometimes when people hear God speak, they can be apathetic about that. But not Abraham. Abraham went to do the will of the Lord without hesitation. Rahab, even at the risk of her own life, obeyed. And they both, both Abraham and Rahab, possessed a living faith that culminated in an act of obedience that that could mean death. Abraham for his son, Isaac. Rahab, her own life. And so I'm going to repeat this question. If the works I do bear witness to a living faith, then what kind of work should I be doing? I want us to look a little bit at the approach of Jesus to knowing and doing the Father's will. I'm going to read some more scripture. So I invite you to turn to John chapter 5. Now Jesus is our example here. Jesus' approach to knowing and doing the will of God. John chapter 5, verse 17 is where I'm going to start. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Verse 19, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, The Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. And greater works than these will He show Him, so that you may marvel. You may be seated. So let me just give uh, six observations that I see in this passage of Scripture. And again, I, I believe that Jesus is modeling for us how we ought to live our lives and how we live and walk by a living faith, a lifestyle of obedience to God. And so Jesus shows us his approach to knowing and doing the will of God. So he says here in verse 17 that the Father is always working even now. That's that's the first observation I see. He says, my Father is working until now. So, So here's observation one. God, the Father, is always working. Now, we know that God created the, the, the universe in six days, and on the Sabbath, he rested. That was an example for us. We need a Sabbath rest. Amen? And yet Jesus says here that God, his Father, Father God, is always working. Now, this isn't part of the message, but it's kind of, it's kind of uh, 
a little bit funny to me because in this scripture, Jesus is being rebuked because he healed a man on the Sabbath. And Jesus basically said in the scripture, the son can do nothing, only what he sees the father doing. So I, I'm, I'm just, I believe that says that Jesus said, look, you, I know you're not, you're not happy with me healing on the Sabbath, but my father is always working. And I can only do what I see my father doing. So it's like the father wants this man healed, so I'm going to heal him, you know. And so uh, what a beautiful thing. Think about this, friend. Think about this. Father God is always at his work. He's always working. Even up until this day, Jesus is saying. Right up to now, right up to this moment, my Father is always at his work. Here's the second observation. He says, and I myself am working. He says that in the, the middle part of verse 17. So, so the Father's always working, and Jesus says, now God has me working too. Father God has me, Jesus, the Son, working too. Then there's a third observation. In verse 19, I love this. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. Think about that. This, this is God the Son says, I do nothing of my own initiative. That's that's key. That's a, that's a, a tremendous example for us. I do nothing on my own initiative. In the area of works, how often do we do things on our own initiative? Now, please hear my heart. I, I've served as a pastor many, many years and the ministry that people do in the body is very, very important to the life of the church. I'm not, I'm not belittling anything that people do as volunteers or works that people do in ministry within the church. Please don't hear that. But how often do we, do we get an urge to do something that really is not something we saw God at work doing. It's not necessarily something that God moved us to do. We just, we just had, a, had this idea, this thought, and in our own initiative, we did something. Jesus did not do that, ever. Jesus always, always, let's go to the fourth one. I watch to see what the Father is doing. Verse 19b, um, he, said, he said, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. You see, you see how Jesus lived his life? Jesus always had his discerning antennas up. You know, he was always watching and listening. And I, I, you know, I pray this prayer often, Lord, give me eyes to see and ears to hear what you see and what you hear. I think that's a pretty good prayer. And so he did nothing of his own initiative. He, he joined the Father in the work the Father was already doing. That's observation number five. Whatever the Son does, the Son also does. So he says, I join the Father in the work he is doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And then this is, this is how that happens. Observation number six. Verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. So here's, here's the point. The Father loves me and shows me what to do. So here's, here's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, saying, and you know what? I, I would challenge you sometime on your own, on your own study, just, 
just challenge, I challenge you to look through the Gospel of John and see how many times Jesus said, the Son can do nothing. The Son cannot speak. The Son cannot, over and over again in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, the Son can do nothing in and of himself. Jesus' life on earth was always a life of looking and listening to discern where the Father was at work. And then he joined the Father in his work. That's how Christ was used on the earth. And I think it's a tremendous example for you and me. Now, if you've heard any of these thoughts before, they're not my original thoughts. They came from a, uh, a pastor uh, named Henry Blackaby, who wrote a book called Experiencing God. I think he wrote it probably back in the, in the early 90s or late 80s. I remember studying it in 1995 for the first time. So I don't know exactly when he wrote it. But here's what Henry said. He said, God's whole plan, hear this, God's whole plan for the advance of the kingdom depends on his working in real and practical ways through his personal relationship with his people. Let me read that again. God's whole plan for the advance of the kingdom depends on his working in real and practical ways through his personal relationship with his people. You know, we, we, must, we must walk in that intimate, personal relationship with Christ. Not just so that we can grow as a Christian, you know. Not just so that we'll be a stronger Christian. No, because God is, God's always at his work. And he's just looking for somebody, looking, watching, and listening that he can invite into the work he's doing. I mean, has there ever been a time in your life, I would, I would imagine that there has been, that you, you had a thought or you heard someone say something and suddenly you, you just, you could not help but do something. And you, you moved and, and that, that compelling uh, thing going on in your heart and in your mind, you just had to do something about it. And you knew it was the will of God for you to enter into that. And you just jumped in in obedience. And you saw the fruit of what God did through you. That's what we're talking about. It's not just initiating something because it's a good idea or it might be fun or other churches are doing it. No, I'm talking about a vital living faith walk with Jesus where the Holy Spirit can speak and we're so in tune with the Lord that we can see where he's at work. We can hear what he's saying as he invites us into the work that he's about. That's the kind of relationship that God invites us to. And so just I, I want to just speak for a few moments here before I uh, close on this matter of recognizing how, how do we recognize that invitation I mean what how does God signal that if God's always at his work and he's wanting us to join him in that work isn't there there has to be a way that God communicates to us that hey I, I'm I'm inviting you into this this is something you, I've gifted you for and I Please jump in here. You know. So how do we know that? How do we recognize God's invitation to join him in his work? So number one, and this won't surprise you, pray. Pray. But don't just pray. I'm so guilty of just praying. Am I, am I the only one? I mean, how often do we pray about something? And, and it just feels like it's, it's the right thing to do, so we pray. And we pray again about that thing. And next week, we'll pray again about that thing. And we pray about that thing, and we go on our way. And when we think of it, yeah, we pray about that thing. But, but the point here, and Henry Blackaby said this, pray 
And watch to see what God does next. Watch to see what God does after we pray. Because if God is always at his work, and maybe we're going along and we see a need, it may be a lost person, it may be a sick person, it may be a hungry person, who knows? But we, we see a need and we pray about that need. And you don't even have to have the resources to meet that need. But you just pray because you're burdened. The point here is pray and watch, listen, to see if God does something after we pray. So I I, I said this earlier, but I pray, God, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear if you want me to join in this. If you... If you're trying to get my attention, God, help me to see, help me to hear what you're up to. So pray and watch to see what God does next. And here's how God will often work next. Here's how God will often respond to your prayers. It may be a chance meeting with someone. It could be a chance meeting with, with an acquaintance that you barely know. It might be a chance meeting with somebody you've never met in your life. It might be a chance meeting with someone you've known for a long, long time. But often when God moves next, it can be in a chance meeting with another individual. It may be words that people speak to you. How many of you have ever had an experience where you... you, you had someone that you trust as a believer say something to you, and it was almost like God himself said that to you. Have you ever had that experience? I can remember one time in ministry, I was debating on, on a move in our, in our family. We had served at a church for eight years. We loved it. Uh, we, we would not move for anything. And my dear friend, one of my best friends in life, we went on a fishing trip. And on the way back, just out of nowhere, he looked over at me and he said, when are you going to do what God's calling you to do? I'm like, Pff. I literally, I turned my head and I wept in, in the window so he wouldn't see me. Because you know what? God was calling me to do something. And so if I'm praying about something, I'm trying to discern something, and a friend says, hey, when are you going to do what God's calling you to do? That may be from God. <laughs> do you hear what I'm saying? And so pray, yes, pray. But then believe that God hears our prayers. Was it Wesley who says that God does nothing except in response to prayer? The prayers of his people? John Wesley said that. So when we pray, we ought to be thinking God's going to do something in response to our prayers. And very often it's going to be uh, chance meetings of acquaintances. It might be words that people speak to you. It might be unforeseen incidents or changing circumstances. It might be material resources that flow your way. Pray and watch to see what God does next. And here's the second. Second means of recognizing God's invitation to you, okay? Pray and watch to see what God does next. Secondly, connect your prayers to what happens next. And it's just the obvious link there. God is at work around you all the time. And he will very likely use you or someone else who's listening better to accomplish his work that's going on around you. And he's trying to draw you into that which he has formed you for. He's gifted you for. So make the connection between your prayers and those incidences that may follow. You know, most of you are aware that Cindy and I lead a, a nonprofit ministry in our neighborhood called Hope for the Hollow. Early on, the Lord the Lord called us to build a park uh, with the help of people that love God. And so we've done that on two and a quarter, 2.25 acres, two and a, two and a quarter acres of, of land uh, that we had bought. We built a park. 
And I can remember early on, um, Cindy and I walked into Chick-fil-A, and, and we, were, we were there as kind of one of these group fundraising things, and, 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 and in walked a, a gentleman that I had not seen for several years. And he's a Christian man, used to be a youth pastor in one of the local churches there in Tomball, but for a couple of decades, uh, he'd been a landscaper. And uh, as we were talking, he, uh, he asked us what we, were, what we were doing. And so I, I began to tell him about, uh, about the work. And um, the more we explained, the more the, you could just see their hearts were, something was going on in their hearts. I mean, they were just, they were becoming more and more passionate about what we were talking about. So we were talking about the park, we were talking about the land, and, and how we were wanting to develop that as a means of serving the, the neighborhood, and it, particularly in, in a place where God could develop a sense of community, because there was none in our neighborhood. And, um, and so this, this friend gave me his card and um, said, hey, I want to I wanna come out and, and see your place. And uh, he came out. And the, the, make a long story short, this man ended up building our amphitheater in our park. And if you've ever been to our property, uh, we have about a 250-seat amphitheater that was built on a, on a natural hill, but it was built with uh, moss rock boulders as chairs. And so it's terraced. And it goes down kind of stair steps down to right in front of the lake. And this man gave his crew to us for three weeks and his, his machinery. He had a, a place um, the, um, that he bought boulders from uh, in the hill country that would be delivered at no cost to us and, and the prices were just incredible. And so we had an amphitheater built by this business owner at no cost whatsoever from him. We simply bought the material. And, and God did that. And I didn't even ask God for that. But it was obvious that God was working in this man's heart because he had something God could use. He had an incredible business of landscaping. I mean, this is a guy who's, who does projects in River Oaks all the time. Okay, so I'm talking about huge projects. Uh, not just a million-dollar home, but I'm talking about million-dollar landscaping. That's the kind of thing that he does. And it's just God used it. What's interesting is one of the things that I wanted to do is I felt like we needed a, like a, a, I call it a prayer cabin, but we needed a place where people could come and they could pray 24-7 at their leisure. So it'd be a little place, uh, just a small place where people could come, they could punch in a code on the door, get in and pray for an hour and then leave. And someone else could come, others could come. Just 24-7, that, that was what I really felt like we needed. <clears throat> I still think God's going to give us that prayer cabin, but it hasn't happened yet. I had a man come and give us $25,000 to build restrooms. I mean, you think about that. I wanted a prayer cabin. He wanted restrooms. I mean, what would you pick? <laughs> well, everybody that comes to the park uses the restrooms. <laughs> Can I tell you that? They probably wouldn't all use the, the prayer cabin. Since then, we had a Baptist uh, associate pastor. He brought 75 people out on a church bus, and they painted about 650 feet of fencing. They stained it. And uh, I'd been, we'd been praying about a basketball court. And uh, Jesse is his name. Jesse, he brings out this crew. They all get off, man. And they, I mean, it's just incredible. In three hours, those guys painted 650 feet of fence. Just 
bam. Jesse says to me, hey, uh, Denny, what else do you guys need? Now, I thought immediately of the basketball court, but I knew it was a, about a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 project. And in my mind, you know what I said to myself? There ain't a church anywhere that would give $25,000 to another ministry. Uh, this doesn't happen. I said, well, we're thinking about this and we're thinking about that. And I named some smaller projects and something I thought they might be willing to do. And then I said, well, you know, we're, this would probably be a corporate donation or some type of uh, foundational gift, but we'd like to do a half-court basketball. Hmm. He said, let me work on that. And, and the, the, the short story version is he didn't spend a dime. But he, he, knew, he knew the dirt yard owner because he attended his church. So we got all the free dirt we needed. He knew the guy who would build the pad with a bobcat. He would move that dirt around. And so he got, he got the dirt moved around. He knew a concrete company owner. So we got free concrete. He knew a subcontractor who basically formed concrete. And so we got, we got a slab formed up, and we had a crew there. We got the free concrete delivered, and the crew smoothed out having formed up the slab. So to, to make a long story short, we got a free basketball court, a half-court basketball court. Somebody even gave the basketball goal. It was about a $2,500 goal. I mean, it, you know, and that basketball court, it, it, it's as nice as any outdoor court you would see anywhere. I can just, I can say that without reservation. All of those things, God, I believe this because God is always at his work and he called us to do. This wasn't just some grandiose idea we had. I mean, God, God made it very clear that he wanted a park in this neighborhood because he wanted to build a neighborhood. He wanted a place where people could experience community. Because you know what? None of them trusted their neighbors. That's why they had keep off, the, you know, no trespassing signs. They all had fences and gates and dogs, pit bulls behind the fences. And you would never go on their property. They, they would say things like this to me. Hey, you know what? You stay out of my business, and I'll stay out of your business. I've had people greet me that way when I was just trying to introduce myself, you know. And so God wanted to change that, and God was at work. He's always working. He's still working to this very day. So connect your prayers to what happens next. I need to hurry. Here's number three. Ask probing questions of those who cross your path to find out what God is doing. So you just kind of probe a little bit. I think, I think this is more in regards to you responding to the need and you interjecting your gifting, or your skill. Um, and so... Um, questions like this. When you meet somebody... You see a need. How can I pray for you? Would you tell me what God's doing right now in your life? What is God bringing to the surface in your life? Is there a specific burden God has given you right now? Do you want to talk about what you think God is doing? And so these are, these are ways for God to communicate to you or to someone else what he's doing. It may be God is inviting you to enter in. It may be that God is inviting the person you're talking to to enter in. But again, it's just living that, that life of faith where our discerning antennas are up, and we're simply just wanting to see and, and do the will of God. 
The fourth thing is listen. Henry Blackaby said, God speaks when he is about to accomplish his purposes. He always speaks. And so, listen. Uh, boy, I ha- I've, I'm right now, I'm in the middle of something that I don't know what to do. I, I really don't. Um, Cindy and I were leaving for uh, vacation in June. We, we were going to uh, Kentucky to spend a week there, a little over a week. Before I went, I had uh, some phone calls about a man in, in our neighborhood who was just living in the throes of poverty. Um, it was a pastor who called me first that I hadn't spoken to for several years. And he said, Denny, I know you're over there in Hazy Hollow, and we've been trying to help a man over there, and we're just not getting anywhere. Have you ever met this guy? And he named his name. I said, no, I've never met him. He said, well, I just was curious because we, we just feel, feel like we're not, we're not getting anywhere. And I thought maybe you may have had some experience with him. But uh, anyway, you might want to meet him sometime and, and just let me know your thoughts. About a week and a half later, I got another phone call. I had not gone over to meet the man, but it was another pastor in town calling me about this very same man. And he said, Denny, uh, have you ever met this guy and named his name? I said, I said no, it's, it's funny, though. I had another call from another pastor asking me the very same thing. He said, really? So unbeknownst to each other, these two pastors both called me about this man. And the second pastor said, look, we, you know, we've worked with this guy for several years, and we're just kind of at a point where we're scratching our head. We've spent money. We've done these things. We're not sure how to help him. You know, it might be good if you'd meet him and just give us some, some word of advice or whatever. And uh, so that same week, a third called me. Had not taken the initiative to go and meet the man. You, you see what I mean by I'm slow? <laughs> I mean, God could light it up on a billboard and I'd still kind of, you know, battle my thumbs around. So... We didn't, we didn't have time to, to respond. We were just getting ready to leave on the trip. And so I just made a note, wrote down the man's address, and we went on vacation. I got a fourth call, another pastor. And then when we got home, the man himself called me. <laughs> and you know where he got my number? He got my number from the guy next door, a, a dirt man who had moved in a rental home, a mobile home. He had moved it in, and he was leveling it. And this guy walks over and meets him. Now, this, this wonderful man, I've used him. He's probably, he's probably dumped 100 loads of dirt on my property. And we have a, a beautiful relationship. Uh, and he's just a very compassionate guy and and uh, he gives the dude my phone number and so he calls me when, when I get home and so I'm like uh, God I think you're trying to invite me into this thing and so I I, I go and I, I meet the man and and I walk up to his little shack, and there's probably a couple of hundred bags of trash piled up just outside the the door. I I walk up the stairs. The first step was broken, so I step up on the second step and I walk up and in. And this is probably about a let's see. He told me 14 by 17. And I, the first thing I see is black mold on the walls and on the ceiling. And I see a single chair that is basically something he built, just nailed together two by fours. And uh, after about 30 minutes, I said uh, to him, Jeff, this, is, this house is uninhabitable. It's dangerous for you to be living here. And... 
um, I don't have another home. But God does. And if God gives me a home, then I'll give it to you. Um, so right now, our ministry is in the throes of an arrangement with Jeff. And I don't know if he's going to go for it or not. Because what we do is we have a home. And uh, we'd like to give it to him to use until he dies. He has no siblings. He has no children. It's just him. And, and so we'd like to just say, Jeff, would you be willing to just, one, give us the house back? And two, since there's really nobody for you to leave your land to, would you consider leaving your land to a ministry where we could repurpose it and bless someone else with a place to live? <clears throat> so we're just in the throes of that and trying to figure it all out. And every day I'm just saying, God, give me eyes to see and ears to hear where you're at work. I don't want to do this on my own initiative, you know, because our ministry is blessed, but there's no way in the world that we could house or give a house to everybody in the hollow who needs a house. You know, and so it's not just about us doing a nice thing. It isn't about that. It's really about knowing and doing the will of God. That's living faith. See, and Jesus, Jesus touched and healed and delivered and fed and, he, and, and, and just made such an impact on so many people as he walked this earth. But Jesus was constantly saying, the son can do nothing by himself. The son does nothing of his own initiative. He only does what he sees the father doing and my father is always at his work to this very moment he's always working and he loves me he loves me so much that he loves to show me where he's working and invite me into that that's that's lifestyle faith isn't it i know that we're busy and i know that there's always work to be done in the church but I, I believe that this is what James was considering when he said, faith without works is dead. I want a living, active faith. But not a faith where I just do of my own initiative, do nice things for people. But a faith that is, that is in intimate, relationship with the Lord where I where I sense when the Holy Spirit speaks and draws or wants to do something even on my behalf when I'm open to that I'm open to that and I respond to his leading that last point after listen was adjust your life to join God in what he is doing Henry Blackaby said it this way, watch to see where God is working and join him. You know, I believe that if we just have a willing heart and we're walking in intimate relationship with, with Jesus, we can't go wrong. I don't believe that God would allow a willing heart to miss his will, to miss his invitation, or just to do something of their own initiative. You see, I believe when we're really praying, Lord, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear. When we truly pray and mean it in our heart, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In my home, in my neighborhood, in my city, 
as your will is done in heaven. I believe when we pray that prayer, God will honor that prayer. I close with this quote by Henry Blackaby. A tender and sensitive heart will be ready to respond to God at the slightest prompting. Amen. Would you bow your head? As we pray, I would just invite you in your own words just to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to know and do your will. I just want to walk in obedience, Lord. You may be here this morning and you have thought, I, I can't do anything. I don't have this skill. I don't have that gift. I can't speak publicly. I can't do any of these things. Can I say to you, my dear friend, you're in great company. Because Jesus couldn't do anything either. He could only do what he saw the Father doing. So, Lord, we just offer ourselves to you in all our weakness and fear and much trembling. Lord, we just offer our lives to you. We want to know you better. We want to walk, Lord, in this kind of living faith. Oh, Spirit of God, we invite you, Lord. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. May we have a heart that will run to obey you whenever you speak. We ask this in Jesus' name. And let the people say amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. It's been so nice to be with you. God bless you.